27. We're going to read a couple of verses there and then go to 1 Samuel 17. Let's start with Genesis 37 now. Israel, or that is Jacob, that's not Israel, the, the nation, that's Israel, the, the person. Uh, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. I just feel like I need to stop right there. And for families with multiple siblings, whether you're willing to admit it or not, there is a favorite child, right? You want, I know you won't admit it, but there is. And if you don't believe me, you can ask any of the siblings. You can ask them separately, and they'll all respond with the same answer because everybody in the family knows which one is the favorite, whether the parents would admit it or not. And if you don't know, then you were the favorite child. So that's just, this just been going on for a long time. I just appreciate the fact that the Bible is willing to admit it. None of y'all will admit it. But that's okay. I appreciate the scriptures. It admits it. Joseph was the favorite because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and they could not speak peaceably to him. Now, I want you to pay attention to this next phrase. Now, Joseph had a dream. Everybody say that. Joseph had a dream. That's what we're going to talk about for just a minute. The power of a dream. And he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Now let's look at 1 Samuel 17 and just one verse 29. I'm reading now the New King James Version. David, this is, we're speaking of David. Now David said he shows up to the battlefield. The Philistines and the champion Goliath are, are, are taunting Israel's armies. David shows up bring his brother supplies he sees what's going on he sees this giant mocking Israel's God and he says what have I done now is there not a cause would you just say that is there amen let's pray one more time father we invite the Holy Spirit as he is here to to move into the depths of our souls we invite the Holy Spirit not to just move in this room but to move in us Come in, Holy Spirit, and shine light in dark places and even open doors that we try to keep closed. Don't let our resistance stand, but break through and let the good news and your grace and your glory flood our souls. Even though we may resist it, come in, Lord Jesus. Come in, Holy Spirit. Father, let us experience and encounter your love today through your word. And we ask it in Jesus' mighty name, the strong Son of God. And let the church say amen. So there are, uh, normally throughout human history, there are two groups in just about any civilization that normally sit on the periphery. There, is the, there are the, the young people, and then there are the older folks, the, the elderly. And then you got everybody in the middle who's kind of raising families, making a career, making the world turn. But in just about any civilization, you've got young people and the elderly. You've got the, the not yet and the has-beens. And that's the way of society. So let's talk about the not yet for just a minute. These are the uh, millennials, mid-20s, mid-30s. There you go. All right, millennials. Any millennials in the house? All right. The Gen Zers, those are the teenagers up to the mid-20s. Uh, if you're an employer or you have worked with any of these people in these categories, millennials or Gen Zers, uh, just look at me, don't, don't amen this, but you will, your spirit will bear witness with what I'm about to say. Uh, millennials and Gen Zers have often been labeled as an unmotivated group. I told you, I'll just <laughs> keep it, they're sitting in the same room. Uh, they tend to be driven by more fear uh, than their parents were driven by. They, they can appear or come off as being a little self-centered. Uh, anybody? <laughs> okay. No. Um, they do suffer from a fear of engaging in 
conversations, particularly when it may involve conflict. They're very handicapped to engage in conversations that may potentially involve conflict. And, and they're so used to sending texts and sending emails and not having face-to-face -face conversations and breathing the same air with other human beings that, you know, this is, this, that's what has led them to uh, where they are. They're, you know, they're, you know they're, they're like the selfie stick wielding, the, 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 the phone is always, you know, facing them and they're, they're posting and, uh, yeah, it can just, they can come off as looking a little shallow to us older generations, and so... Uh, that's sort of been the, the characterization of millennials and Gen Zers. Now let's talk about the boomers, 60s and up. Yeah, see, y'all thought y'all was going to get off. Here's what they're saying about those 60 and up. Not me. I am just did a little research, so don't shoot the messenger. 60 and up can see, and this is your chance, so y'all can get ready to amen. Uh, 60 and up are characterized as uh, being a little insensitive to cultural issues. Have you ever experienced that? Your grandparent ever say something they're not supposed to say, and they don't even know they're not supposed to be using those words. So, yeah. You need to have some conversations with your grandparents, and, yeah, they will embarrass you. <laughs> have no idea. They can be seen as a little out of touch with social issues, um, technology has bypassed them. It just, it went right past them and didn't even stop. They're still got, they still got hotmail emails and are still trying to figure out how to send a group text. You know, they are just very handicapped in the, in a technology world. Uh, they seem like, and the, one of the big fears that they have is, their replaceability in the workforce. One of the fears that boomers have is all of these, all of these young, fast-moving and quick-moving uh, millennials that are being hired in the workplace are going to replace them in the workplace. Um, one of the challenges that boomers face is just simply navigating a very complicated healthcare system that we have where they're just trying to stay healthy and stay alive and make it to the doctor's visit and make sure they go to the right doctor. I mean, that, that's a huge challenge for boomers. Just that is a task in the world in which they live. But here's the thing about boomers, and I think it's a, it's a discredit, but they're definitely not seen as ones who have passion and who have a dream. They're not, they're not seen as one who carry much expectation for the future. They're just living and surviving and trying to make it. And so in both of those groups, whether it's millennials who are self-centered and won't, you know, seem to be unmotivated or boomers who seem to life has passed them by and they're just trying to stay alive, or if it's any of us in between, what's missing is a dream. Millennials need a dream. Boomers need a dream. We all need a dream burning in our hearts, giving us a reason to get up in the morning, giving us a purpose for life, taking us from a place of just going through the motions and existing to having a purpose and a reason and a passion for living. Amen? How many of you wave at me and say, we need a dream? And I came to tell you today that a God-given dream can change everything. Not only, we're not talking about just a dream that you conjure up or come up with. I'm talking about a God-birthed, God-spoken, God-given dream. If you lay hold of a God-given dream, it can change everything in your life. The Old Testament prophet Joel prophesied, and it was quoted at the day of Pentecost, that our old men would dream dreams and our young men would see visions. And my prayer today is that would be a reality in the house of the Lord, that our, that our old men, that our boomers, that are that our, uh, the ones who that they say are no longer relevant, that, that life has passed them by, that God would stir up in our boomers dreams and they would dream again. And they would realize their purpose and that God's not done with them. And for our millennials, that they would see vision. Listen, our young people need a vision. 
They need vision. They do not need to be idle. They do not need to have a bunch of time on their hands. They need a purpose and a vision burning in their heart with the expedient attitude that I've got to get up. I've got to get this done. I've got to pursue my high, my high calling in Christ Jesus. They do not need to be, our young people need to see visions. There are two people that we talked about who had a dream. And, and I'll use the word, the concept, dream, vision, destiny, purpose. This is all the same, the same thing. First was J Joseph that we read about who had a dream even at a young age. He was Jacob or Israel's youngest son. He, as we read, walked around like Elton John with his coat and his brothers hated him but in spite of the favoritism in spite of the spoiling of his family he had a dream the peculiar thing about Joseph's dream though is that his dream took him on a journey he had a dream early on at 17 years old he saw it he saw it in his mind's eye but it took a long time for it to become a reality his dream took him on a journey to a pit to a prison, and eventually, after many years, the dream finally began to materialize in a palace. But he didn't just dream it and then step into the palace. His dream took him on a very long journey until he finally reached it. And can I tell you, some dreams come with a journey. Some dreams come with a journey. And if you have a dream and your dream it's taking you on a journey. I just want to encourage you today to not give up. Don't jump ship. Don't abandon it. Listen, some dreams come with a journey. Some dreams take a lot longer than you thought they would take. Anybody say, yeah, my dream is taking quite a while. Yeah. If it's taking you quite a while, it might be that God instead of working on your dream, wants to work on you. And in the journey, he's working on you. So don't rush it. Don't get impatient. Don't jump ship. Don't abandon it. Don't change it up for another dream. Hold on to the dream and let God work on you. Because during the journey, he's working. Listen, God can make your dream come true yesterday if he wanted to. It might just be that, and I hate to say this, but you need a little work. I need a little work. It might be that we need to take a little journey with Jesus so he can work on us to get us ready for the dream. Could you imagine 17-year-old Joseph being thrust second in command in Egypt? What a, what a terrible idea. I mean, that young kid who's been spoiled all his life has no experience, no leadership abilities. He's just a snotty-nosed, bratty kid, self-centered, make it putting him in charge? That's a terrible idea. That's why God took him on a journey. God showed him the dream, but he said, before you get there, we've got to do some work on you. So he took him to a pit. And it was in the pit, I believe, that God broke off some of that entitlement, some of that snotty-nosed brattiness. It was in that pit when he was sold into slavery that, that God broke some of that off of, off of him and, and put in its place gratitude and appreciation and thankfulness. And then it was in a prison, when Joseph ended up in a prison, that God began to break off some of that, just that immature mentality, that immaturity, and begin to replace it with wisdom. And we see God working on Joseph, breaking off self-centered, replacing it with gratitude, breaking off immaturity, replacing it with wisdom until he's ready to step into his position in the palace as a God-placed leader. God may be working on you. So let me encourage you. You may have some scars. You may have some traumas. You may have faced some battles and you carry the wounds of those battles. But those scars and those traumas and those wounds are the very thing that qualify you for your dream. 
If you didn't have those scars, if you didn't have those wounds, if you didn't have those traumas, you wouldn't be ready for your dream. But because you carry them, you're wiser now. Because you've experienced them now, you're more patient. You're more ready. You're more grateful. You will appreciate the dream when it comes to pass. So hold on. Look at somebody and just say, hold on. The dream is on its way. The other example we looked at was David, another youngest son of the family. He was Jesse's youngest son. His, and, and, and if you know the story, the context, his older brothers have, had, were enlisted men, were going off serving in Israel's army. Israel's in a conflict with the Philistines. So just think of that. that his, the, the older brothers are, are bringing honor to the family's name by serving in the nation's military. He, however, has been stuck to take care of the sheep in the pasture. So he's at home taking care of sheep, no dignity, no, there's, there's no clout that goes with that. He would rather be standing by his brothers, of course, serving in Israel's armies, but he is in the pastures taking care of the sheep. But what we learn in the story, in God's providence and sovereignty that it was in that place it was in the pasture that God prepared him for his dream and for his destiny do you remember what he said you remember what he said in in first Samuel same chapter in verse 34 when David shows up on the battlefield he sees what's going on he doesn't understand why somebody doesn't take this guy out and he says as much he says to Saul your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after it, and I struck it, and I delivered the lamb from its mouth when it arose against me. I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Boy, don't you just love that audaciousness. Seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. I'll tell you one thing that that passage, that principle speaks to me, is we need to take care of the demons in our house before we ever step out into the battlefield in public and worry about helping other people with theirs. Take care of the lion. Take care of the bear. Take care of the giants. Take care of the demons in your own house first. And I know, I know, I get it, I understand. There's, nobody is applauding you, nobody's appreciating you when you're fighting that battle. The battle fought in private brings no accolades and no rewards. You don't get appreciated for that battle. You don't get celebrated for that battle. Nobody's patting you on the back for that battle. But you've got to win that battle first before you ever step out in the public battlefield. Take care of the bear. Take care of the lion first, and that is what will qualify you to step out on the field with Goliath. Look at somebody and say, take care of the demons in your house. I know there's no glory in it. I know nobody's going to come and tell you, great job. That's a great job, the way you're loving your kids instead of fussing at them. That's a great job, the way you're dating your wife instead of letting conflict fester and brew under the surface. You're doing a great job. Nobody's telling you that. But you've got to win that battle first because that's the battle that qualifies you for the public battle. Winning the battle in private is what prepares you to win the battle in public. So the Bible says a few things about dreams. Number one is this. Proverbs 29, 18 in King James says, where there is no vision or dream or destiny or purpose. We'll change all of those words up. Where there is no vision, the people perish. So the first thing Scripture says is you need to have one. First thing Scripture says about a dream is you need to have one. If you don't have a dream, you're dying. If you don't have a vision for your life, you're going nowhere. So you got to have one that means have a dream not just for yourself but for your family have a dream for your marriage what is my marriage going to look like have a dream for your children what are my children going to be doing for the lord what are they where are they going to be in 10 years have a dream for your career second thing scripture says 
In Habakkuk 2, 2, it says, the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it. So not only do we need to have one, but we need to clarify and communicate it. We need to dial it in. What is it? What are you talking about? This is not just vague, indeterminate adjectives we're using. This is our dream. This is our future. This is what God's purposes are for our life. So let's dial it in. Let's get specific. Let's let, make sure it matches up with our talents and our giftings. And let's, let's dial it in and clarify it and communicate it so that people that hear it can partner with you and maybe propel you into it. Joseph had a dream, and he communicated it. It got him in trouble, but that was God's plan anyway. David had a dream, and he said, is there not a cause? Sometimes just voicing your dream will put wheels to it. Sometimes just, just communicating your dream will get things moving, will get things moving in your children's life, get things moving in your career, get things moving in your marriage. Sometimes just talking about it, being clear and communicating it will put wheels in motion. So clarify, communicate it. The next thing is this. Get God's dream. If you've been here any amount of time, you know we don't preach or teach or believe in the American dream. You cannot do anything you want to do. You cannot be anything you want to be. I know there's bubbles popping all over the room. What? This is America. We can be anything. We can do anything. Not really. You can't. You've heard me use this example, but I don't care how, how good the nutrition is. I don't care how good and renowned the trainer is. I don't ha care how much exercise you give a donkey. He will never win the Kentucky Derby. But that is the animal that I would want to carry my packs through the mountains of Mexico. Everybody has gifts and purpose that are tied to their destiny. You need to know what yours are. You need to know what your gifts are because they're tied to your destiny. Amos 3, 7 says this, Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants and prophets. Can I tell you something? God is not playing games. He's not keeping secrets from you. He's not teasing you with your destiny like a carrot on a stick and playing hide and seek with you. He's not doing that. Like, seek him. He, he, re, he will reveal his secrets to you if you'll ask him. And another thing is this is, and you, I mean, I know you know this, but we don't dream, we don't see dreams, we don't see our futures with our eyes. As a matter of fact, if we, Scripture tells us we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. We see this. Well, all these things we're talking about, we see it with our heart. So you got to see it with your heart in spite of what your physical eyes see. And a matter of fact, if you want to know what your dream is, if you want to dial in and get specific, then the thing that your heart sees that contradicts what your eyes see, that will probably point you to your dream. What you feel burning on the inside, that it should be like this. We should do this. I should move in this direction. This should be happening. And yet you don't see it with these eyes. Whatever that is, is probably what God's called you to. It's that, it's that, that tension between what is and what should be. Your heart can see what should be. Your eyes see what is. Maybe that's what God's called you to. He's not keeping secret from us. Think of Martin Luther King Jr. He's a great example. He saw stuff with his eyes. He saw the prejudice. He saw the injustice. He saw the discrimination in his generation, in his world. He saw it all in the social systems, in the government systems. He saw it in the religious systems. He saw it in the churches. But it didn't stop him. He communicated with clarity what he saw in his heart. And history records that he had a dream. Do you have a dream? Do you have a dream from God? Let me give you this real quick before we close. The dream represents, each letter of the word represents things. Number one, D is destiny. If you have a dream, you have a destiny. 
You're no longer just floating downstream. You've got purpose. You're swimming upstream with a passion. R represents reaction. If you have a dream, your reaction to situations is going to be different. When you live for something higher, listen, things that used to set you off and push your buttons and offend you, when you have a dream and you're living for a purpose, you don't have time for that. That silly stuff just doesn't even ruffle your feathers. It's like water off a duck's back. Like You're just not offended anymore because you're living for something greater. Your purpose is higher than these little things. So it affects your reactions. Next thing is E, expectation. When you have a dream, your expectations go up. You expect more. You live for more. Your standards go up. You don't just settle with any old kind of way. Your expectations are raised when you have a dream. It affects, the next letter is A, it affects your attitude. When you have a dream, man, the sun's just shining bright. When you're living for purpose, listen, you got a reason to get up in the morning. When you, have a, when you have a dream and a purpose and a destiny, your spirit is lifted. Every day you have positivity and direction and hope and faith. Like Paul said, if, if God is for you, then who can be against you? That's your outlook on life when you have a dream. And the last thing is this, M, you have a motivation. You have a reason. Listen, this attack on our mental health in our society, I'm, I am convinced that one of the antidotes to this attack that, is, attack that is called depression, such fear and such anxiety and such worry in our culture, the antidote to all of that is to have a dream. When you have a dream, you've got a purpose. When you've got a purpose, you can overcome fear. You're motivated to get up, to move forward, to take another step forward and another step forward, to see it done when you have a God-given dream so have a dream and I'm going to close with this when we think of dreams I think one of the things we tend to do is we let we let our minds think of other people other people have a dream we think of them we think of those who've had dreams and have changed the world we think of Martin Luther King who changed the civil rights movement we think of the Wright brothers who were told that human flight was impossible, but they had a dream and they saw it through. We think of Thomas Edison who had a dream to harness electricity and use it for good purposes. We think of Steve Jobs who had a dream to take a computer, a computer from a desk and put it in our pockets. And I think when we think of dreams, we think of People like that. We think of other people. But I want to tell each and every one of you that God has a dream for you. This is not a message about them. This is for you. God has a dream for every one of you. Just point at yourself. God's got a dream for me. Just say that out loud. God's got a dream for me. You've got to see it. You've got to believe it. He's got a dream. So what is it? What's your dream for your marriage? Is your, mar your marriage may be on the rocks today. But listen, if you have a dream for it, you'll overcome whatever it is, and you'll get to what could be. You start dating her again. She can start showing you the dignity and respect. And you can get to that place you dream about. What is your dream for your children? Listen, when we have dreams for our children, and kids, you, I know you hate us for it. But it's because we have dreams for you that we don't just let you go anywhere. We don't let you go to certain places or parties. It's because we have dreams for you that we don't let you just have liberty on your, de your, your devices and your phones. I know it drives you crazy, but we set limits because we have dreams for you. You'll thank us for it one day. But it's because we dream of a better future for you. What are your dreams? What are your dreams for your job? You may be thinking, Pastor, I, I'm so tired of my job. I hate where I work. The people are driving me crazy. I'm not making enough money. That's fine. What's your dream? What's your dream? 
What's your dream for your career, for your job? What's your dream for your ministry? Some of you are working, but you've got a ministry that's bubbling up on the inside of your soul. You're not sure how to connect the dots yet, how you're going to make a living, how you're going to make all these things work. Don't worry about all that stuff. Dream for it. Step for it. Follow the Lord into that. It's his dream for you. God's got a dream for every one of you. My prayer today is that you will see it. And when you see it, you won't ever let go of it. It may happen quickly or it may take years, but that's okay. The dream might be so big that God's got to work on us a little bit. Maybe the bigger the dream is, the more time it takes in preparation. But that's okay. He's getting me ready for what is to come. Would you bow your heads? Father, I thank you for your call. Paul said in Ephesians that there were good works designated for us before we were formed. God, that tells me that you had a dream for me before you made me. And you made me to fulfill that dream. That's true for every one of us. You had a dream. You had a calling. You had a purpose. You had a plan. You had a destiny. And so subsequently, you made us to fulfill it. So God, the greatest tragedy would be we walk through life clueless. We walk through life not ever seeing it, not ever knowing it. So today, God, we know that you're not keeping secrets from us, so We ask you, Holy Spirit, would you show us the Father's dreams, his plans, his purposes for us? Would you show us, Holy Spirit? Right where you are, could you just take a moment and do that? Maybe just lift your hands, but with your eyes closed, could you just ask the Father that? Father, would you show me your dreams? Would you show them to me? What are your plans? What are your your great ideas The reason for my being here, ask and he will show you. Seek him with all your heart, Jeremiah said, and he will show you even the the secret things. Some of you may know, but that may not be all there is. God may want to reveal and unfold higher things, greater things, newer things. Father, would you reveal to us by the Holy Spirit your great dreams for us? Thank you, God. Thank you, God. With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. I don't know what your dream is. I don't know what God's plans are for you. There's so many people in here, so many different kinds of people, so many different kinds of gifts represented in this room. It's so beautiful to think of the, the mosaic, the tapestry that is just sitting in this room, the variety and the beauty of the body of Christ. So I don't know what all of that looks like, how it plays out. But I do know that God's plan for everyone in this room is that you would know and walk with his son, Jesus. His will, his stated desire is that all would be saved, that none would perish, but that all of us would enjoy eternal life with him. So if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I'm not walking with Jesus. I'm not living like he's my Lord, like he's my Savior. I need to come back to Christ. Nobody's looking around. But if that's you and the Holy Spirit's dealing with you on that, would you just slip your hand up in this moment? Thank God. I see those hands. Thank you. Thank you. I see those hands. Anyone else up in the balcony? God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Anyone else? Thanks be to God. 
about seven hands raised. Anyone else? I need to walk with Jesus. He is the one holding my dreams. How could I know my purpose if I'm not walking with him? I want to walk with him now. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. You can put your hands down. If there's anybody in this room, you say, Pastor, I'm walking with Jesus, but I feel like I'm walking blind. I don't know what his plans are for me. I can't say that I have a specific destiny over my life. I'm just kind of doing my thing, doing my job, doing this, raising my family. But there's not a, my heart's not seeing anything. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I'm, I want the Lord to show me. I want the Holy Spirit to reveal, remove the veil from my eyes. Thank you, thank you. God bless you, God bless you. Can we all stand to our feet? So many responses this morning. Listen, we're going to sing, and if you raised your hand, I'm going to ask our auditor team to come down and get ready to minister. Those of you who raised your hands and said, I, I need to be walking with Jesus, listen, they're going to be here to lead you in a prayer of salvation, of repentance. Those of you who raised your hand and said, I need, I need to be able to see it, I want to invite you to come down when we sing. And we're going to pray in agreement that the Lord is going to open your eyes and blow your mind in Jesus' name. That in these altars, in just a moment, that God is going to reveal to you things that are exceedingly, abundantly above all you could ask or think. And it's you he's talking about. So as we sing, would you come? If you need to come and give your life to Christ, if you need to come and, and see and pray, have God's plans for you revealed. Come now and let's sing. Let's sing. Come and pray. Let's come and seek the Lord. Let's come and ask the Lord.